Hey everyone, and happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Today we are featuring the awesome graphic novel, Superman Smashes the Clan by Jean Lewin Yang. The year is 1946 and the Lee family has moved from Chinatown to downtown Metropolis. While Dr. Lee is eager to begin his new position at the Metropolis Health Department, his two kids, Roberta and Tommy, are more excited about being closer to the famous superhero, Superman. Tommy adjusts quickly to the fast pace of their new neighborhood, befriending Jimmy Olsen and joining the baseball team, while his younger sister, Roberta, feels out of place while she fails to fit in with the neighborhood kids. While the Lees try to adjust to their new lives, an evil is stirring in Metropolis, the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan targets the Lee family, beginning a string of terrorist attacks. Multi-award winning and New York Times best-selling author Jean Luen Yang and artist Guri Hiru tell a bold new story based on a classic Superman radio serial. I'm going to be reading from the essay that he leaves at the end of the story. It's called Superman and Me. Um, I'm not going to read the whole essay, but it is very much worth reading. So let's get started. This is Superman and Me, an excerpt by Jean Luen Yang. I can't remember when I first discovered Superman. Was it the classic 1978 movie starring Christopher Reeve? Or the old Super Friends cartoon? Or the Superman puzzle book I bought at a school book fair in the first grade? I don't know for sure. He seems to have always been there. I liked his powers, of course, but I loved his costume. The emblem on his chest looked like a badge or maybe a shield. It told everybody that he was Superman, and that was awesome. I've never had a run-in with the Ku Klux Klan. The racism I encountered as a kid wasn't nearly as dramatic as a fiery cross. It was quiet and subtle. In the seventh grade, I wrote a story about Cobra Commander's death. Cobra Commander is the arch enemy of G.I. Joe, a team of superhero soldiers who ruled after-school cartoons in the 1980s. Mr. Stevens, my teacher, liked my story so much that he read it to the whole class. He ended in his most ominous voice. As Cobra Commander breathed his last, he hissed, G.I. Joe has won. The other students clapped. I tried to keep my smile as humble as possible. G.I. Joe, one of my classmates said to me, cool story. We'll call him Danny. Danny was broad-shouldered, hazel-eyed, and athletic. He wore clothes that you saw on billboards, and he never tied his shoes, which everybody thought was awesome. He gave me a thumbs up. My smile stopped being humble. Later in PE, I saw Danny standing on the soccer field. He'd actually talked to me. I thought, I ought to return the favor. I walked up to him. Hey, Danny, I said. Hey, he said. G.I. Joe, cool story, man. High five. He put his hand up. As soon as I reached for it, he pulled back. I'm not touching no. And then Danny said a word that rhymes with stink. I watched his shoelaces drag along the grass as he walked away. Shortly after the incident with Danny, I started pestering my mom to take me to the local mall. One Saturday afternoon, she finally did. I made a beeline for a store called Aka Joe that sold clothes you saw on billboards. I picked out a bright white sweatshirt with the store's logo on the chest. No one is sure who first came up with the idea. Stetson Kennedy, an intrepid anti-Klan reporter, said he had brought the idea to the radio show's staff. Kenyon and Eckhart, an advertising agency that worked with the show, said the idea was actually theirs. Bob Maxwell, the head of Superman Inc., claimed he had to convince Kenyon and Eckhart to get on board. He certainly had reason for wanting his company's premier superhero to take on the Klan. As a Jewish American, Maxwell recoiled in horror when he read about what white supremacists had done to Jewish people in Europe. He felt a duty to fight bigotry however he could. To avoid getting sued by an organization that was legally recognized in several states, the show's writers created a stand-in organization called the Clan of the Fiery Cross. There was no mistaking their intention, though. The fictional villains had the same costumes, rituals, and beliefs as the real-life Ku Klux Klan. Maxwell read through 25 different scripts before landing on the right one. There were plenty of risks, so he wanted to be careful. What if the story was too preachy or too scary? Superman might alienate his young fans. 
Even worse, what if a listener only tuned in to a part of an episode and left with the impression that Superman actually condoned bigotry? The script had to get things just right. On June 10th, 1946, the first episode of the 16-part The Clan of the Fiery Cross storyline aired. For the next several weeks, listeners all across America huddled around their radios to listen as young Tommy Lee his father, Dr. Lee, and his unnamed mother and sister moved into Metropolis and ran afoul of a group of violent bigots. They cheered when Superman leapt to the family's defense. The storyline had its detractors. Klan supporters in Atlanta called for a boycott of the show's sponsors. Bob Maxwell even received death threats from the New Jersey Klan. Most people, though, loved it. The Adventures of Superman received awards from the United Parents Association and the Boys Clubs of America. Newsweek magazine called it, quote, the first children's program to develop a social consciousness, end quote. Listenership soared. Some believe that Superman's radio defeat of the Klan of the Fiery Cross led to the real-life Klan's public image downfall. After being portrayed as bumbling, hateful rubes on a children's show, the Ku Klux Klan would never again command the same level of respect it had once enjoyed. After World War II, many Chinese American veterans did what the Lee family did in the Klan of the Fiery Cross. With help from the GI Bill, they moved out of the nation's Chinatowns and into the suburbs. They were often met with hostility. Once they got to their new neighborhoods, some were threatened. Others had garbage thrown on their lawns. Some chose to move in the middle of the night to avoid trouble. Even so, in part because of the public image shift that had happened after Pearl Harbor, Chinese Americans were able to make the move. Not all non-white Americans were as lucky. Black veterans had a much harder time accessing the GI Bill's benefits, despite the bill not having any language about race. In the South, where most African Americans lived, the federal government handed over the bill's administration to racist local officials. Many black veterans were denied the home loans they had rightfully earned, so they were unable to make the same move the Chinese Americans had made. Japanese Americans also faced hardships. Even after they were released from the internment camps, most could not recover the homes and businesses that had been taken from them. Their own government had erased their pre-war lives. The Klan of the Fiery Cross is made up of intolerant bigots, Clark Kent tells Jimmy Olsen in the Klan storyline third episode. They don't judge a man in the decent American way by his own qualities. They judge him by what church he goes to and by the color of his skin. Intolerance is a filthy weed, he continues. The only way to get rid of it is by hunting out the roots and pulling them out of the ground. Superman was leading us to a bright new tomorrow. Unfortunately, Post-war America didn't follow him all the way. We left the double victory incomplete. My mother was born in China in 1945, a year before the end of World War II. During the first years of her life, her family moved from one city to the next, trying their best to escape violence and starvation. They eventually made it to Hong Kong and then Taiwan. After graduating from a Taiwanese college, my mother came to the United States. She met my father, who had also come from Taiwan. The two of them went on to earn master's degrees despite not having completely mastered English. They courageously faced down racism and other indignities and went on to build a life for themselves and their family. My parents were able to achieve all that they have not only because they worked hard, and believe me, they worked hard, but also because they immigrated over two decades after the Lees first moved to Metropolis to an America that had not given up the struggle for a true double victory. We are still in the midst of that struggle. After my father arrived in America and before he met my mom, he was terribly lonely. He lived in a boarding house with other students. One of them was named Dave. Dave had dark brown hair and Clark Kent glasses, and he'd grown up in a town that was a driving distance from campus. Dave must have sensed that my father needed a friend. Despite the language barrier, Dave began talking with my father. First one conversation, then another. On holidays, when the house cleared out, 
Dave invited my father to go with him to his parents' home. Dave's parents and siblings welcomed my father with open arms, and they shared many meals together. I felt a lot less lonesome during the holidays, my father says. I'm grateful for that warm friendship. Fifty years have passed. My father and Dave each found wives, raised families, started and then ended careers. They are friends to this day. When I think about what the future ought to be like, I don't think about my junior high classmate with the untied shoes. I think about the friendship between my dad and Dave. Superman is one of our nation's and the world's most enduring icons. He seems to have always been there, and he's not going away anytime soon. Ever since defending a Chinese-American family in 1946, he has stood for tolerance, justice, and hope. Even today, the immigrant from Krypton challenges us to follow his example more fully and more perfectly. We have to meet his challenge. After all, though our yesterdays may be different, we all share the same tomorrow. Jean Lewin Yang, August 2019. The letters ACA stenciled in an oval. It looked like a badge, or maybe a shield. I silently hoped that it would protect me from that word that rhymes with stink. It did not. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And again, happy Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month. Be sure to check out Superman Smashes the Clan, the awesome graphic novel by Jean Lu and Yang on Hoopla. Thanks so much for joining me and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.